Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Buitink, and today I have the great pleasure to talk to Warren Mosler, one of the founding fathers of MMT, Modern Money Theory. Warren is also a former hedge fund manager, former U.S. presidential candidate, developer of super sports cars such as the Mosler MT900 and a boat producer. Warren has an engineering economics background and uh, resides on the U.S. Virgin Islands. Hi, Warren. Welcome on the show. Hello. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, great honor to, uh, to talk to you. I've been following you for, you for many years. Okay. Um, first question, I, I know you've explained it by now already a gazillion times, but could you briefly, sure. one more time, summarize uh, what MMT is about before we uh, uh, dive into um, uh, some interesting questions? Okay, so let's say it's about sequence. Okay, so what you have is a world where up until MMT at least, uh, they, any, you could ask any congressman, any member of parliament, and he knew how it worked. They had to get money in their account for the government's account before they could spend it. And so they had to either tax to get money in the account, or if they wanted to spend more than that, then they had to go out and borrow again to get money in the account to be able to spend. That was their idea of the sequence from the government's point of view. They bring in money one way or another, and then they spend it. And all the mainstream economic models uh, have, are the same. They, they all are, have that assumption built into them. So what's happened is M MMT has entirely overturned that understanding because what um, is obvious to everyone in the central banks, in fact, I don't even have any discussion with central bankers about this, they already, they've already known this, that the funds to pay taxes, the funds to buy government bonds, they all come from the government. They originate with the central bank. They don't come from the private sector. Okay, so the congressmen are just mistaken. What, what's happening is that the government has to spend first before the funds are there to pay taxes or to buy bonds. And, and so instead of the government needing the economy's money to be able to spend, it's the other way around, where the economy needs the government's money to be able to pay its taxes. Okay, and from that, uh, that, that is the core understanding of MMT uh, as it was uh, you know, brought into play in maybe back in the early 1990s in the financial sector. I, I then introduced it to the academic community uh, in 1996 on the internet, and some of them became involved and uh, still are, and they're the originals, which is uh, Bill Mitchell, Randy Ray, and then Stephanie Kelton, maybe a year or so later, uh, and uh, Matt Forstad, or that, that group of us. If you got the sequence backwards, like the governments do, then they're worried about how they're going to get the money because they, you know, and you heard it in the U.S. If, you know, the U.S. is going to go broke, we're going to turn into the next Greece. What if we can't borrow from China, et cetera? What if they don't lend to us? Obama, President Obama went to China, our bankers, to make sure that they would finance our health care. I mean, they believe they had to get the money before they could spend it, when actually, you know, it's the other way around. So once you understand the government's spending first, and then the private sector can pay taxes, oh, all, the debate changes. It just fundamentally changes. You're no longer asking the question, where is the money going to come from? Because it's not even an applicable question to, this, to, the, uh, to how the monetary system operates. Now, there's, there's more to... MMT from that, but that's the beginnings. That's the beginning, uh, and, and that's the main operational understanding that allows you to then look at the public debate, you know, very differently from the people who are, very differently from how it's been looked at all these years. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the, of the mistake that a lot of uh, congressmen or politicians in general and, and also economists make when it comes to uh, uh, how banking works uh, uh, with, with the yeah. assumption that banks first need to borrow before they can lend, uh, even though, right. um, of course, in practice, banks would just create the deposit when they uh, create the loan. Um, yeah. And this is another one of those mistakes, which I don't understand why, for in, in your case, then, or in the case of, of MMT, why didn't central bankers do a better job explaining the process all these years when talking to their uh, minister of finance or when talking to uh, congressmen and politicians in general? Well, you know, they tried. If you read Charles Goodhart, you know, way back 1960s, his published papers, he's a uh, Bank of England. You know, he was explaining this you know, perfectly clearly. He was having debates with the monitors and of course he'd win the debates and it still didn't get into the public understanding. You know, I had, um, 
I was reading years ago, I was reading a pamphlet from the first national, from the Fed, Chicago, Chicago Fed. It was explaining how, you know, the money worked. It was just like you said, banks taking deposits and make loans. And there was an officer there, her name was Anne Marie Leyendijk or something like that. And I, I called her, I said like, you know, what's going on? You know that it's not the way it works. It, loans create the, the causation goes from loans to deposits. Banks buy promissory notes, pay for them with new deposits. And she says, well, you know, we just thought it would be easier for people to understand it the other way around. And I'm thinking, here's a central bank with its saying something that they know is incorrect because they think it's easier for people to understand. I just said, well, that's, that's a disgrace. I mean, you're there to be educating people on how things work. You're the ones who understand it and you don't, you know, fabricate how bank operations work just because it's easier. I said, I guess that's like completely unacceptable. Anyway, I, a couple of years later, I looked at their website and or their pamphlet, whatever it was, and uh, it's, it said the same thing, loans create, uh, banks taking deposits and make loans, but there was an asterisk. And at the bottom it said, in practice, uh, particularly among the larger banks, uh, the loans create their own deposits. <laughs> so that was the best they could do. So that's exactly to your point about they don't see their role apparently as an educational role, mm. which is almost entirely what it is, right? Yeah, exactly. Just public purpose. If you're serving public purpose, that's what you should be doing. Yeah, for sure. And then, um, if I understand correctly, the the main policy, or the, let's say that the the main goal the government in in the MMT world has is to make sure that that there's full employment and and to keep infl inflation uh, under control. Uh, and the policy tools well, they have is to to add currency yeah. by spending or to uh, withdraw currency by by taxing. Well, you know, I don't say that. What I say is, tell me what your policy goals are, and I'll tell them what you can do to achieve them. I'm sure there are a lot of um, people who want high, like high unemployment. Okay, it's a whole lot easier to get a plumber or to get somebody to fix your car or something like that, or to cut your grass when there's unemployment. It's only 10% are unemployed. Okay, you know, the other 90% kind of like that. It's not. <laughs> and so I, I wouldn't be so quick to assume that uh, everybody's got the same you know, goals here. Uh, so, but I think that at least on the surface, uh, in the United States, at least, that the, the policy is to promote full employment and price stability. And so we've given, um, you know, we, we can give you policy uh, proposals that to meet those goals, yeah. assuming those are your goals. And then when they don't do it, you know, you have to wonder whether uh, they're serious about those goals, right? Yeah, but assuming those are the goals, that those are also the goals that the Fed at the moment has, right? So, uh, but they're using the interest rate as a policy. Yeah, uh, yeah. they have no tools to do it. No, because, the, but yeah, so if, if then in, in the ideal MMT world, do we even need a separate central bank or would you just merge treasury and central bank into one entity also to avoid yeah. uh, the fiscal monetary conflict that you would otherwise uh, possibly have? So, so number one, they have the interest rate thing backwards, right? When you raise rates, that promotes inflation, and it's basically it's basic income for people who already have money. You're you're paying interest on, you know, the net savings in the economy, which is the public debt, and uh, that goes to people who already have money. So there are a lot of people that support basic income, but I haven't heard anyone who supports it only for those people that already have money. In fact, it's generally quite the opposite. So, but that's what the Fed does. Uh, they believe that by paying interest on the public debt which is really a fiscal transfer operationally, that, that somehow is deflationary, but, but it's not. It's inflationary and it's expansionary. And it's, it's very regressive. And you can have a more regressive policy. So I'm categorically against using high rates to, uh, to support you know, aggregate demand because of the regressivity of it. Okay, but the thing about ha having a central, separate central bank or treasury, it doesn't matter. It's... Uh, it's just organizational. You have to have somebody um, uh, to set the policy rate. Now, Congress could just say, we're going to have a permanent zero policy rate, and then you don't need federal open market committee. Uh, that's my base case for analysis. And if somebody thinks the rate should be different, fine. But, you, you know, you got to convince me why that would be the case. And I have yet to, after 50 years, I've had yet to hear a convincing argument as to why we shouldn't just leave rates at zero and do other things to achieve our goals. But, you know, somebody might disagree. So if you want... To change it, there has to be some entity in the government that changes the policy rate. But 
you're going to leave it alone and you don't need the Fed to do that. But the Fed has uh, important roles in the, maintaining the payment system and, uh, and bank regulation. And so if you combine them with the Treasury, well, the Treasury would have to do bank regulation. And uh, but, but in a way, uh, you're, aren't you complicating things by having a separate uh, um, central bank balance sheet and having the Treasury? I mean, I think it also makes it more difficult yeah. for most people and even for politicians, especially yeah. for politicians to understand the whole thing, to understand the yeah. scheme. I, yeah, and I agree. I agree. But also, you know, a corporation will have, uh, you know, different departments and each one will have their own profit and loss and accounting statements because they feel it helps manage the corporation to be able to keep track of these things separately. At the same time, yes, it does maybe make it more difficult to understand it as a whole what's going on. So, uh, but you can do the accounting either way, whether you call somebody the Fed chairman or the treasury, uh, you, you know, executive in charge of bank regulation, you, know, you can call whatever you want. And, it, and so maybe from an organizational point of view, it would make sense to reorganize, but it's, it's not that important in terms of what your options are for public policy. It might be important for promoting an understanding. So, you know, I'll just separate those two things for you. So I'm not against uh, consolidating it, but you can't consolidate everything in the government. Oh, yeah. You can't have the military and the Department of Education all consolidated. You could. But it's no, okay, you know, but that's, that's, that's a first, yeah. these are two very different things, right? But I, I can imagine. Right, right, right. So there's different tasks. Yeah. So the Fed has its tasks to do bank regulation. That could still be it. They're, they're the payment system of how the checks clear and how they offset operating factors. Nobody in Treasury does that or would know how to do that. You'd have to have the same people in the same offices doing the same thing. But maybe you'd call them a, a branch of the Treasury if you wanted to. That'd, that'd be okay. But you know, operationally, you're not going to change very much if you do that. What about bonds? Um, why yeah. would we still need to um, issue or, or pay uh, pay interest on, on 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 bonds if we can also yeah. just uh, yeah work yeah. with reserves only and just have uh, the right. interest rate fixed at zero percent forever? Right. So I would do that. I would my I, you know my base case for analysis is a permanent zero rates, pay interest on reserves only, and don't bother with bonds. Now, under current institutional arrangements, if you wanted to move to that structure. It requires legislation and that type of thing. If, on the other hand, the Fed just has a zero rate policy, you don't need any legislation for that. We already have one. And if the Treasury decides to issue only nothing longer than a three-month bill, they can already do that. It doesn't take any change in congressional authorization or anything like that. And we're, for all practical purposes, we are there because the Treasury, three-month Treasury is about the same as you know, cash deposit. It's a, dep it's a bank deposit at the Fed. It's three months. It's it's just a short CD, you know. So, uh, so I propose for simplicity and for ease of uh, transition into this policy that we have the Fed announce that, yeah, or, or Congress tell the Fed, you know, leave rates at zero permanently, and that the Treasury would uh, have a directive to not issue anything longer than a three-month bill, and then we don't have to change a lot of institutional structure, and it's marginally less efficient than if we had all reserves. But there, there are. A lot of institutional structure around treasury securities and three-month bills are used as collateral, for example, and uh, all kinds of lending agreements and uh, bond defeasances and things like that. So that would all have to get redone. So if you don't want to redo all that, just leave the maturities in three months, which functionally doesn't change anything. It, you know, it doesn't make the, it, it, so that, that's why I proposed it that way. Yeah, what about ownership of the of the central bank? Of course, in, in the U.S., it's owned by uh, private institutions, even though... Well, not exactly. You know, that's like, uh, for all practical purposes, it's owned by the Congress. For uh, I used to own a bank, a small bank, and I had shares of the Federal Reserve. And I had to buy them, like $100,000 worth. And at the time, they paid 6% interest. Now they pay less. It was no different than if I had a, a six, you know, a... a a CD or, you know, a deposit at the central bank that paid interest. They never called me. I never had to vote on anything. I never had a say on anything. The shareholders today, and I'm not saying it was that like that in 1913, but the shareholders today of the Federal Reserve are just depositors. And the whole point was to have deposits so the bank had capital under the gold standard. They wanted to have some gold to get started. So we're not just depositors. There's no gold standard anymore. It's just vestigial. There's no management or input from any of the shareholders uh, as a consequence of being a shareholder. You don't get anything except 
It's no different than if you put a hundred thousand dollar deposit at JP Morgan, you're not gonna, they're not gonna, you don't have any control and ownership or anything. So it's all under the Federal Reserve Act. The, the president appoints the people, the Congress controls what they can do, what they can't do. Chairman Bernanke he was in front of Congress every other day asking permission to do this or that. And he said, look, I take my marching orders from Congress under the Federal Reserve Act. So it's not independent in that sense in the US any more than the military is independent. No, but but also there you could argue that it's, it it adds to the complexity complexity of things. Um, yeah, yeah, and if it's you want, if you start uh, uh, mopping things and, and consolidating yeah. things, then must possibly this would also be one of the options to consider. Yeah, all, all you have to do is give all the shareholders their deposits back. Right. My bank that said, okay, here's your hundred thousand dollars back. You're not a depositor anymore. They could have done that, which would have been fine with us. You know, we didn't care either way. It's a very small amount that that these banks have on deposit there. And, it's, and again, it's nothing more than a deposit at the bank. It's not shares the way it is with a normal corporation where you get voting rights and that type of thing. There, there isn't any of that. It's just a plain old simple deposit. Right. So a lot of hard money folks uh, would say mm -hmm. that we need to raise interest rates soon in order to avoid uh, inflation. I just yeah. heard you say, and also, I mean, I've heard you say on, uh, many times in the past that the opposite of that is true and, and higher rates uh, would lead to higher inflation. That's yeah. um, even more counterintuitive, I think, uh, to many people yeah. than, 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 than the other uh, premises of, uh, of MMT. Yeah. Could you um, elaborate how that would work in practice? Sure. Because um, yeah, it's, it's, so, for me, it's still mind boggling. Okay. These hard money people aren't wrong. What they, are, what they have proposed is something that's applicable to a hard money system, which is a fixed exchange rate system, like a gold standard. So under a gold standard, if you have gold outflows, which could lead to uh, devaluation and inflation and whatnot, then you might raise rates to attract gold uh, into your country so that uh, that wouldn't happen. And in fact, you, you pretty much have to do that. And you have to not just pay the higher rates to bondholders, you have to raise taxes to make sure you weren't adding money to the system. Otherwise, uh, it would just blow up, which is what happened in, with Russia in 1998. They had a fixed exchange rate system. The ruble was fixed to the US dollar. And they raised rates to try and bring in money without raising taxes or, or uh, you know, somehow reducing the uh, supply of convertible currency out there. And they got rates up to 200%. And of course, you're just paying more interest and all those people wanted their dollars and they ran out and the system blew up. The October, August, I think it was 17th, they you know, collapsed, they shut down. And in fact, the people in the central bank walked out. I don't even know if they turned the lights out. <laughs> and the central bank didn't operate for several months. Uh, so, uh, so yes, they are correct. It, it would be correct in Hong Kong. It would be correct in Bulgaria. They're fixed to the lev is fixed to the euro. It'd be correct what they're saying about what you should do about interest rates to protect your reserves, which is the core of a hard money system to protect your reserves. And in fact, they measure inflation by the number of reserves. If you double your reserves, you've doubled them. Your convertible currency, you've doubled the money supply, and everything else is relative value. So you have just doubled your price level. Okay, now with floating exchange rates where you don't have that convertibility feature, that's not applicable. So now what we have today is the government, when they raise interest rates, there's not a tax increase to reduce the demand that they created by paying the interest. So when the US government, for example, cut rates to zero a few years back from 5%, uh, interest payments you know, went down or would have been $400 billion higher a year with the uh, 5% than they were with the zero. Okay, so that actually just reduced the budget deficit and took that much income out of the economy by lowering rates. And it is a deflationary event. It didn't cause inflation. Everybody thought that was going to cause massive inflation when uh, the Fed lowered rates by that much. And it did not. And it's been 10 years and it hasn't happened. And everybody thought when the European Central Bank lowered rates and then went negative, it would be, it would be uh, uh, inflationary. China panicked and you know sold their euros because they thought they were debating. The European Central Bank was debasing the currency by bringing rates down, and by guaranteeing all the member nations of bringing their rates down that they were debasing the currency, and it hasn't. Okay, and they all um, thought that negative rates was now going to be hyperinflation, and it hasn't been. And they all thought QE was going to be inflationary, and it hasn't been. Those things would have been if it was a fixed exchange rate policy. 
So again, the hard money people aren't wrong. They're just, it's just a different channel on the television set. You know, it's not applicable to the floating exchange rate where a lot of things work somewhat the opposite of uh, fixed exchange rate regimes. How would you explain all the asset uh, price inflation that, that we have seen uh, also in, in, in floating yeah. uh, rate regimes? Sure. So um, if you look at Japan, after 30 years of zero rates and more QE than we could ever dreamed of, uh, they have no asset price inflation. If you look at the euro area, after 10 years, including negative rates, they don't have the asset price inflation. So the U.S. does. I, I think we have to attribute it to something else other than um, the, the interest rate policy. Now, you will get one-time adjustments as you get interest rate policy, but you don't get a continuous increase in prices. So the U.S. has other reasons in here on why certain asset prices are going up, you know, and others, others aren't, of course. But and anytime any asset price goes up, everybody says, oh, that's asset price inflation. Well, okay, but let's look at the specific assets and why they're going up. And generally, they're pointing to the stock market, right? And, or or uh, real estate markets. Yeah, you know, or the real estate market, yeah. And... Um, so, you know, we have fiscal policy in the U.S. has been, um, you know, we've been running a larger budget deficit the last year or so than the other um, uh, Europe, Europe has or Japan. But if you look at the uh, new home sales, the last three months have collapsed. And that's with zero rates. And that's with the supposed asset price inflation. Though nobody talked about that anymore. We had lumber go up to 1600 plus, and now then it falls to the 500s. You know, everybody talks about asset price inflation when it's going up, and when it drops, you don't hear about it anymore. So um, I think we've had a lot of, uh, you know, one-time issues. The COVID issue, of course, had a lot of supply disruption, but what nobody talks about are the tariffs. The Trump tariffs, uh, you know, we had the Trump tax cuts, which helped the economy a little bit, but then when the tariffs started, we, we had, an immediate deceleration of employment growth and you know all kinds of other things and um then we had the covid dip and then the covid recovery and now we're going back down on the same path we were uh from the tariffs and the biden administration not only supported the tariffs but have doubled down on them getting they're going to be extra tough on china for example and buy america and that type of thing and it's uh you know that's been a major contributor to this recent downslide and let's say this latest reversal of asset price inflation that came from the COVID bounce, right? So yes, the U.S. has had asset prices moving around. I don't, I don't see the interest rate policy or the QE as having supported that. Okay, I just don't see any broad evidence around the world that that's what it does, and I don't see any theory that explains the channel from this to from here to there. Well, at least here in Holland, where I live, we uh, yeah. have seen real estate prices going up and up and up because people are um, able to borrow more because of low interest rates. So um, yeah, okay. if, if we would raise, if the ECB would raise rates and, 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 yeah. and I would expect um, consumers to be able to um, borrow less and prices to yeah. fall. You know, I, I remember this argument back in the 80s and I was talking to somebody from uh, Australia at the time, a real estate agent. He's I said, how's the real estate market? He said, well, you know, rates are 17 and a half. He said, it's real, it's, it's pretty strong. He says, it's, we got a good strong market. Rates are 17 and a half, he says, but I think if they put them up to 18, it's gonna kill it. I said, okay. My next call was to somebody from Japan. And I said, how's the real estate market? He said, well, it's pretty weak. Rates are three and a half, but I think if they take it down to three, it's gonna get going again. So, you know, how important are the rates? I, I've seen this go on for a long time. And at the end of the day, in the maybe not in the very short term, but in the medium term, it's always something else that's affecting those prices and not, it's not so much the rates. Okay. And because uh, the rates filter through to other things, they, uh, you know, reduce income. You've seen, uh, you know, low personal income growth in Europe and things that would normally support housing. So, you know, I, I don't know the specifics of your housing market, but I think if you take a close look, there'll be something else driving that other than rates. Maybe it's foreign buyers getting a lot of offshore money. And in the cities like London, it was all foreign buyers, right? It wasn't about interest rates. Okay, let's let's move to uh, central bank digital currencies. So what, what is your yeah. view on that? Well, I, I don't, it's a slogan. I, you know, I don't know specifically what that actually means or what, they're trying to accomplish. I, I think that 
what the central banks are trying to accomplish is to be able to keep track of transactions so they can tax them properly. <laughs> and so they, if they got everybody using currency that they clear and not rather than cash, then they have the ability to like not let uh, tax liabilities slip away. But I, I'm not sure beyond that what they particularly care about, you know, but maybe you can help me on that. I, Cause it just says, digital central banks. And then when I try to read the story about details, there, there never are, they're studying it. It's not a coin, it's a blockchain for decentralized. So I understand all that, but what? Yeah, there, I, there's I several different yeah. uh, ways to implement this. And we have, uh, yeah. of course, in China, they're a bit further and yeah. they have already piloted uh, something. And I guess in China, there's even more need to, to control and monitor all the transactions uh, of everyone. Uh, if you look yes. here in Europe, but also I think in the US, uh, it it's, remains to be seen how it will be implemented and how uh, popular it will be because uh, it, it doesn't seem to add a lot of uh, uh, new features for uh, for users. Uh, you could argue that it would be interesting, for example, for, for the ECB to have a digital equivalent to cash also in order to be less dependent on foreign big tech, large tech firms, big banks, and to to, to keep some sovereignty when it comes to payments uh, in the Euro area. Um, yeah, I don't think it's about sovereignty though. I, I think they're worried because, uh, you know, I was reading about a year ago how, um, you know, the, it, the European Union had a 300 billion trade surplus, but when you added up all the sources of that, it came out closer to zero. And they suspect that that's 300 billion of imports coming in under the table so they don't have to pay VAT. And, and I think that might be their motivation to try and capture that somehow so that that doesn't happen, right? More than, because they have total uh, control over the Euro. They don't have any problem there. Tax liabilities are in Euro. People have to pay them. They, those Euros to pay taxes don't come from any other market. They don't come from crypto market or anywhere else. They come only from central bank. They're just debits and credits on their own books. So I, they've got a tight system that's just their own spreadsheet. They make all the debits and credits already. So I, I, don't, I don't see it like being threatened or anything like that by competing currencies or anything. These are all different assets that people can use to, uh, not that they all do, but I think their concern is that they're used to avoid taxation at this point. Some people argue that it could also lead to funding problems for uh, for commercial banks if it becomes too popular. Do you share How would that? that be? I, I don't see that. Yeah. I just don't see it. You know, a commercial bank buys a loan. They, they You sign a note. They pay for it by creating a deposit on their books. How, how does, and that's where the funding comes from, right? And then if one bank won't lend to another, it means one's long and the other's short at the central bank. So the central bank will, you know, clear that. And so I, I don't see like where this comes from, the idea that there can be funding problems due to other assets trading for transactions purposes. I just don't see it. What, what's your view on, on, on bank uh, credit creation um, in, in general? Do, do you think it's, uh, it's, it's good that we, that banks have that, um, uh, that uh, possibility or do you prefer to have a more of an, uh, a, a, a model where banks indeed have to borrow before they can loan or where, where consumers and customers can own shares in those banks in order to fund the banks? Yeah. So um, you have to look, look, the banking system is a creation of Congress under the Federal Reserve Act. It's the same in other countries. It's a legal thing and they become members of the Fed and they have checking accounts that are called reserve accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank so that they can clear with it. So if you move money from one bank to the other, that can happen through the clearing system. And, um, you know, ultimately they have sub clearing, but it ultimately clears through the Fed. And so, um, you have to decide, like, does that serve public purpose? Before Congress enacts anything, whether it's the military or public health, it's, they don't have to do it. They only do what they think serves public purpose and is, you know, public infrastructure that uh, is, you know, somehow constructive for, for the country. So it's looking at it as a clean sheet of paper. If you're Congress, it's the question you're asking, what, what, do you, what is the banking system? What should it look like to, like, do the job? So you need a payment system. So banks, setting up banks so that they can take in deposits from people and so you can pay your bills that way. That makes sense. And the next thing it is, well, what about lending? These are public institutions, you know, under the Federal Reserve Act. Should they be allowed to lend? Who should determine credit quality? Should, uh, you know, uh, how do we price risk? Should there be shareholders they answer to when they price risk? Or should it just be like a public bank that 
prices risk for political purposes, which is what public banks have to do. They have no other way to price risk. And, uh, and, and there's pluses and minuses to both. And you think it through from that point of view. And one of the answers you come up with very quickly or you realize is that if you're going to have the private sector pricing risk, uh, banks making decisions like that, these are, you've created a very, very dangerous animal. And you've got to regulate it very carefully before you let this thing out on the loose. Regulate it and supervise it, okay? Because it can do, it can add a lot of volatility and create a lot of damage and be very disruptive. But if it's properly regulated and supervised and it works within a narrow institutional framework, it can serve public purpose. You could make housing loans and you could make car loans and you could facilitate lending that you think serves public purpose. But you don't want to let it get away and start doing other things like financing you know, people trying to go have leverage long positions in the stock market. Why would you want the government to support something like that? But we do, okay? And so uh, it, and those types of things are just a failure of government to understand what it has and its role in the creation and regulation of its own banking system. So a clean sheet of paper, I don't think Congress would allow these banks to do it. They, a lot of the things they do. The reason they do is we say, well, you know what, it does no harm and they're private, so they have shareholders, so they should be allowed to pursue any path that makes a profit. It's not true at all. These are specifically set up for public purpose in a narrow framework. And yes, there are shareholders like they're shareholders of public utilities, but those public utilities can't go out and do whatever they want. They're limited to generating electric power or whatever the public purpose of their institution is. You know, but when we go to banking, they've kind of forgotten that that's the, uh, you know, the order of responsibility, that this is a public institution created for public purpose and we're in charge of this. So again, in, in the whole 2008 crisis, of course, I, to me, it's just a big massive failure of government to regulate and supervise the financial structure that they created. How? Was that uh, with your answer? No, but so I mean, there's just so much to say about uh, about this, of course. But if if you if you had uh, to say you would, if I understand you correctly, you would at least try to overhaul some of the existing regulation in order to uh, tame the banks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got I've got a piece that I've had out for a long time on my proposals for banking system, and it's very narrow banking, and. Uh, a lot of things they do today, there's, I see absolutely no reason they should do that. Uh, why should they lend against financial assets? How does that serve public purpose? Just eliminate that. Well, why should, uh, we can eliminate the whole interbank trading market by just allowing them to have overdrafts at the Fed without penalty, without stigma. And it's functionally the exact same thing, except you free up tens of thousands of people involved in interbank markets that could go out and cure cancer, do something useful rather than being paid to do this silly thing at the expense of people who use banking service services. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I've got, I've got a whole list of uh, banking proposals that narrow banking, probably a lot more narrow than other proposals I've ever seen. Yeah, that could, could be a topic for, for another episode. Uh, um, you know, look, and a lot of people say, well, the answer is just go to a public bank, but, but they, they're just as dangerous as private banks. They're, and, and Europe has a lot more experience with public banks than the U.S. does. And you've had massive problems with public banks over the years getting politicized like within, within two or three days, right? And uh, I remember when the French banks every few years used to go down with billions and billions of losses, U.S. dollar losses back when that was huge money. And it was all in, you know, insider trade, let's call it trading, but lending to each other and whatnot. And, uh, it would just all be absorbed as part of the public debt. And there'd be a little bit of uh, price level would change, a little inflation, and then everybody looks the other way and moves on. So, I, you know, you had that for, I don't know, a long time. And the German banks, same thing, right? So, uh, yeah, that's a risk. But that's, isn't that a risk of MMT in general? Then that's um, if, if you want to um, give the government uh, more power in a way, especially when it comes to, for example, being the uh, employer of last resort, which of course is something we haven't discussed yet, but a very important yeah. uh, part of MMT too. Don't you think um, that, that you run the risk of, of the government uh, getting too much power in deciding yeah. um, uh, what's, what's going to be produced? Yeah, well, what MMT does is shows you how that system works 
tells you what the risks are so that you can deal with them. It doesn't propose taking the risk. It just shows you how the system works, what the risks are, and maybe give you some ideas on how to you know, deal with those risks. And so now the money story is where the um, employer of last resort comes from. Okay, so let me give you the sequence again as we started. The uh, actual, the, the money story begins with a government that wants to provision itself. You know, I don't begin the money story with people who are bartering and they decide to, it's easier if they use some kind of warehouse receipt or gold or something to make it easier. Maybe they do, but that's a different story. The story of today's governments is that we have governments who want to provision themselves. They want a military, they want public health, they want public education, whatever they want. Uh, and how do they do that? So the, the, they have to move real resources out of the private sector into the public sector, which presumably make the private sector more valuable. You know, if you're moving resources to build the Panama Canal, you've facilitated trade and lowered costs, and now the remaining resources in the private sector, you know, life is better because you did that. You've brought your costs down. It's a massive productivity gain. So presumably the public sector there is to support what are ultimately real productivity gains, either, you know, physical or psychic productivity gains for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the economy. So, they, so you have a government that wants a military and a legal system and public health. So how do you get people out of the private sector? So the way we do that is, the first thing we do is we impose a, a tax liability. Okay, we don't collect money because there isn't any. We impose a tax liability. And let's say, for example, it's on everyone's house, real estate tax, a simple asset tax. And in my base case for analysis, I use an asset tax. Now, an income tax will work, but it's complicated and it's convoluted and it, it's cyclical and all that. So I don't start with that when I'm explaining to people the basic concept of how it works, but it, it can be uh, you know, layered on without any problem. So we'll start with a real estate tax on everybody's house. And now what you've done is monetize the economy because now you have a population that overall needs to, to figure out a way to pay its tax or it's going to have its house sold at public auction, right? It's got to be coercive. You pay the tax or you lose your house. All right. They say, well, what's the tax? And so, well, it's $10,000 a month, uh, a year, or whatever. Well, what's a dollar? I mean, nobody even knows, right? The government says, oh, uh, well, that's the thing you need to pay the tax. And by the way, if you serve in the military, we'll give you $50,000 a year. If you want to be a judge, or uh, we'll give you $150,000 a year. If you want to be a doctor at the public health, we'll give you $125,000 a year. So the government imposes a tax, which creates a population now looking for paid work to earn the money to pay the tax. That population looking for paid work are called unemployed. We define unemployed as people looking for paid work who can't find it. And until the government starts spending, everybody's looking for paid work and can't find it, or looking to sell their products of their work for dollars, you know, directly or indirectly, they're looking for dollars and can't find them. So the purpose of the tax is, you might say, to create unemployment, to create people looking for paid work. And another, an MMT contribution is that the, the cause of unemployment in a monetary society, mon unemployment as we define it, is the tax liability. The tax liability is what causes unemployment. There is no unemployment in the world without tax liabilities as we define unemployment, people looking for paid work. All right, so you create tax liabilities in one form or another. Now you've created unemployment. What's the purpose of creating all this unemployment? It's to hire people to work in the government. That's why you did it. And you can now hire them by spending your otherwise worthless dollars, as I've been saying for a long time, uh, because people need them, the economy needs them to pay the tax. Now, not everybody has to need them, but some people need them. And people who don't want to work with the government will pay the tax. We'll sell, try to sell things to people who do work for the government. And you have a monetized economy. So the sequence is tax liability creates unemployment. The government then hires the unemployed it created and pays. The next thing it does is pays them. Now the economy has the money to pay the tax. Okay. And when they pay the tax, that is the end of this cycle. And that's why it's called the tax return. You're doing your tax return. That's the word revenue, which means return in Latin or French or something. All right. So, and render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, right? That's, he spends his coin, you use it to pay your tax liabilities, and that's the end of the cycle. So that, that's the core of the MMT money story. So the unemployed are created by the 
tax liabilities, the government then hires them. But what happens is our tax liabilities have created more unemployed than the government wants to hire. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. Simple point of logic. All right. And so what do you do about that? It's a the unemployment, the residual unemployment is a government creation. They put a tax liability on it, created 10 million unemployed. They hired 5 million people and there's still 5 more million that looking for work. It's like, uh oh, what do we do? But when, once this economy is established yeah. and, and there's enough uh, uh, dollars in the system and there's unemployment, then uh, the government could also make it easier for private companies to hire people uh, in an easier way or it could do other things to and reduce unemployment all the way to zero because there's enough uh, dollars in the economy to pay taxes. So someone can yeah. also just uh, get dollars from another from, from someone else in the private economy in order to get enough dollars to pay taxes. You don't necessarily yeah. need the government anymore at that and point are, to hire people. And you are, you are technically correct, but the process for that to happen, okay, is... So let me back up to explain why that's not a practical solution most of the time. Sometimes it is, okay. The tax liability creates a desire to a need to pay taxes, but also a desire to save. Okay, because once you've got people coming to work, you're going to have um, uh, merchants need cash in the cash register. People want cash in their pockets. Uh, we give tax advantages for not spending your income and putting it in a pension fund. So you've got all these people who don't want to spend their income. Okay, and that creates a shortage of money to pay taxes for the rest of the people. So if the, uh, if the government did all its spending with one guy, let's say the total tax liability is five trillion, three trillion dollars or something, maybe it's more, let's say uh, $4 trillion. And they paid one contractor four trillion and said, okay, go hire everybody to do everything. And, and he paid everybody three trillion and got them to work. Now he's got a trillion in his pocket and he doesn't want to spend it, he doesn't want to hire anybody. We've got a, an unemployment problem. Okay, because there's not enough money left in the economy for those who need it, uh, you know, to pay taxes and to net save, because this guy wants to save. Now, there are ways, you know, so trying to practical, let me, let me give you a, another example, the same thing. My wife and I were in Pompeii, and uh, we came to the, we were on a little tour, we hopped on one of the public tours, and the guy showed us these uh, coins, and they were just cheap metal, and he said it was a nice place to live because they would collect these coins for taxes and they would pay people to, for, to do sanitation for public safety. <clears throat> and I said, well, you know, actually they would pay the people first and then collect the coin. He goes, no, 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 you collect taxes and then you pay the people. So I said, well, where'd the coins come from? He says, well, the government made them. <laughs> so I go like, how did anybody get a coin to pay the tax? He says, so they, pay the people first and then collect that. He says, yeah, how else can it work? And he grabs his head. He goes, no, 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 no. He walked away. He wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the tour. Okay. Everybody who lived in Pompeii knew that they put a tax on something, maybe everybody's house. And then people would go to work for the government to earn money, you know, to, because uh, everybody needed the tax. They'd pay them to do police work and to do sanitation. And then other people would sell those people pizzas or something and get the money and, and the economy was modernized, the tax got paid. Now they found 20,000 coins in the street. All right, well, how did they get there? <coughs> the government had to have spent more than they collected. That's what we call a deficit, deficit spending. So people are coming up looking to earn coins. Maybe the total tax was 80,000 over the years. And people earned 100,000, all right? Now you could say, and, and where were those coins? Well, they would have been in somebody's pocket, except they were burned up. They would have been in the merchant's place of business, except that was, you know, under the ashes and everything. They were, they were in the street. Okay. That was the money supply in the economy. That's the net money supply in the economy. And it comes from the government. Okay. And it, it, it's not like a problem or something you pay back. It's just the, the coins spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. Because the people had other uses for them. No, I so understand why there, there's a, there's a need from for society to, to save to to, to have yeah. financial uh, yeah, savings yeah, yeah. to 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 and and that's yeah. so, something they can use the government currency for. They can use other means too. They yeah. can yeah, yeah. they can buy shares or real estate or or cryptocurrency or whatever. But uh, how would you then, as an MMT uh, policymaker, how would you decide then 
what the uh, the rate of an unemployment is where you start to intervene because if you make it easier yeah. for companies to hire people that would yeah. also be or if you could if you yes. make it easier for people to well, can I, i'm all in favor of all yeah and we've got, i've got a lot of supply side proposals i i, I, I know I'll, i'll get to that so here here's the government and let's say you're in pompeii and there's, there's you've got all the police and fire you want and here's all these people showing up for work that want to earn more coins you'd rather have them in the private sector but you know that they're there because of your tax, because there's no other reason they would be there, okay? You know that somebody in the economy who spent these coins is saving them. Some merchants got them to make change or something. Okay, so you have a choice. You either hire these people or you figure out a way for the private sector to get them back in the private sector. So the first thing you would do is lower the tax, okay? Because you know your tax created more unemployed than you wanted. In the U.S. government, we created 5 million un more unemployed than we want. And they're out there unemployed, you know, collecting benefits. So if we lower the tax, they will go away and there'll be enough demand in the private sector to hire them, except for one thing. They are damaged goods. The tax liability that caused them to become unemployed has damaged them in a material way in that the private sector doesn't like to hire people who are unemployed. They prefer to hire people already working. Okay, and so, yes, I'd like to lower the tax, but when I do that, They only go back very slowly. Instead, I see inflation and I see uh, wage pressures and bottlenecks. And I say, why, why don't you people hire the unemployed? Well, I don't know if they're on drugs. I don't know if they can get along. I don't know if they're clean when they come in. It's too, it's too risky. If I hire them and have to let them go, the labor laws are too strict. I'd rather hire somebody already working who has an employment record. And I'll pay extra and I'll cause inflation before I hire these unemployed. You've seen this in Europe where the... Nehru or whatever you call it, it's like eight, nine or 10%. Crazy. I mean, losing that much real output because people don't want to hire the unemployed. So we do things to facilitate the unemployed being hired, right? Okay. One of the things we can do, which works amazingly well, okay, and it's tried and true, and, and it is pro-agenda for, for pretty much everybody, is If we offer a, well, let me call it a transition job to all the, uh, anybody willing and able to work to promote this transition back to the private sector, why does it promote it? Because once you're showing up on time and working every day, whatever you're doing, that fact alone makes you more attracted to the private sector that now wants to employ you because we've lowered taxes, we've increased aggregate demand, they need more people. And those people will transition, then transition to the private sector. So it acts as a way to transition to facilitate this transition. And it's been tried several times around the world and it works beautifully every time. It worked in Argentina, which was actually MMT proponents doing it in 2001 with the Hefe's program. They took in uh, two million people entered this program after the, you know, the country blew up with 32 dead in the street in 2001 and they floated the currency. Uh, Daniel Kosar was in the labor ministry and he got it through and they offered this job to every head of household. It wasn't even everybody. And out of 2 million people that went into that program, a million of them transitioned into the private sector. Now, these are people nobody ever thought would work. They were disadvantaged, they called them. They were Indians. They were like people that were looked down upon. And all of a sudden, a million of them are part of the economy. And they had the best economy in the world. And India has shown this to happen with the rural poor program. But they have other issues, but they've shown that once people are working, they become much more attractive to the private sector and get hired. So the, the job guarantee is one thing we can do. It's not the only thing, of course. There are a lot of other good things we can do. But it's one thing the government can do to amend its error, which was overtax based on the number of people it wanted to hire. Now, the other thing the U.S. could do is say, well, maybe we want to hire these 5 million people. Maybe we need green new jobs. Maybe we need more teachers. Maybe we need more public health workers. But we haven't looked at it from that point of view. We've looked at it from, you know, we don't want to run a deficit or whatever. So number one, you want to fully provision your public sector to do useful work that serves public purpose if there isn't. But you don't want to just provision it with make work. Okay, you want to just provision it with useful work. So to, you fully provision it. And then everybody else, you want to be doing useful work back in the private sector. Okay, so number one, the U.S. government is way under provision. Everybody's short of staff. The police department where I live in the Virgin Islands has 70 or 80 when they need 200. Okay, so, we're, we're, you know, there's big shortages. 
fully provision your public sector. Don't over provision it. It's not an employment agency for friends and relatives of people in government. Okay. This is, you know, it's got to be efficient, but don't starve it to where the public streets are crumbling and we've got infrastructure falling apart. Get it, get it to the right size, whatever that is. Not, you know, with the, and then have a transition job to get the rest of the people because you've still over taxed, lower the tax to get those extra people back into the private sector. And you can do a lot of other supply side measures. I'm not um, trying to take away from those. A lot of proponents of the job guarantee answer like, well, there's a lot of things that can be done. And that's why we need this job guarantee. And I go wrong answer. If there are a lot of things that we need the public sector to do, they should be hired in the normal course of business in the public sector. They should be hired at normal rates of pay for the public sector that are long and hard fought for, you know, to, uh, to have uh, equitable pay in the public sector. And that's how we should hire those people if you've got lots of useful things to be done. If you've got people doing those useful things and you still have uh, unemployed, now you want to hire them into a transition job and I can talk about what they can do. But the main point of it is to have them gainfully employed employment record coming in every day and being there to be transitioned to the private sector. So I've suggested that we can fund nonprofit organizations to uh, at the job guarantee wage, which is not the normal public sector wage, a lower wage, and that they could hire people they want to take care of their needs, knowing that we're going to probably take those people away. The private sector is probably going to take those people away from you as we reduce taxes and have supply side things to uh, to make sure there's enough aggregate demand for everybody. Okay, um, clear enough. Yeah, yeah. On, on the topic of um, we, earlier, we discussed uh, the uh, um, the public banks that they could also fill yeah. back in France and Germany, and they run a risk of being uh, politicized. There are yeah. some downside risks of of having a very flexible currency, in my view. And and one of the main worries I have with a very flexible currency is that it can also be used to wage wars. We've uh, the previous century was the century of yeah. wars, and also the century of of, yeah. of um, getting off the gold standard and having uh, yeah. um, free floating um, currencies. Do, do you, uh, how would you mitigate that risk? How can you, how can you make sure that um, it's not going to be abused and, and, and going to be used for fighting endless wars like we've seen with the US especially? Yeah, I know. And you know, you could say the same thing about atomic energy, right? <laughs> when they first discovered it, or electricity or you know, dynamite, get Nobel Peace Prizes for the people who invented dynamite, trying to ease their conscience, get out of purgatory or something. So uh, yeah, okay. So look, there were pretty serious wars fought in the gold standard too. Now they suspended it in time of war. So uh, the question is, no matter what you have, how do you get governments to not want to go to war? Because it's easy enough to just change whatever policy they're on to, to do it. And uh True. The so you're saying hard, hard money standard is always a, is, is is as as flexible as as a because in the end when yeah. it comes down to it the government will will get off the the hard money standard in order in order yeah. to but it, it's it's more yeah. it will be more difficult I guess especially so if what, you enshrine it in the constitution and and you make yeah. sure it's yeah so what what it's a hurdle you know getting everybody to belong to the same country was an idea of one way to get rid of the war so that's what the European Union did back when it was first starting which is kind of when I was your age probably the whole one of the main points was to not have a World War III start in Europe. And to some extent that succeeded. Now, unfortunately, the, the, a lot of ugly baggage went with it, all this austerity and the way it's just been this torture chamber. But at the same time, being one society, you're not seeing these European countries you know, on the brink of war with each other. So uh, I think what you, comes down to is some kind of political unity that's perceived as equitable. So there's nobody to go to war with. Uh, and uh, I think the European Union was a step in that direction. Unfortunately, they got the economics wrong where they're, uh, you know, it's a major problem. Now we had Brexit, but we didn't see a war between England and, and Europe. Okay, and no. it wasn't even discussed. So uh, so that's that's a huge positive step that there hasn't been a war in Europe. There've been wars other places and I think the European Union in terms of uh, how to prevent war among the members has, is a pretty good example. And then how to promote prosperity, it's, it's a horrible example, of course, it's the opposite. So, uh, and, and the lack of promoting prosperity is about to tear it apart and take away this master, this, this you know, massively successful anti 
war organization is about to break down because they can't run the economics the way they can potentially be run. But I, at least we're seeing signs around the edges that that's changing, uh, you know, with what the ECB has been doing. The amount of deficit spending that was allowed under COVID was unthinkable before COVID and, uh, and before MMT, I might say. So maybe MMT gets some credit for that. I know the leadership has spoken about it. So I'm sure they don't want to scare anybody because the public perception is that MMT is runaway money printing. They know that it's not. But they also know now that they can facilitate whatever spending they think suits true public purpose. And so they're um, slowly moving in that direction. Unfortunately, a whole generation of human beings has had to suffer under the transition. But, you know, that's, you know, I can't really look back at this point. Looking forward, I see some hope of change here. Oh. Um, final question, um, if you allow me. I know we've rerun a little bit uh, yeah. over time, but um, so it's called modern m uh, money theory. Um, at the same time, uh, we actually modern about... monetary theory is how they say. It. Oh yeah, because I got the book of um, of, of uh, uh, Ray, uh, and it it says here modern money theory. I guess there's what year is that? That's the book. Um, it was in twenty twenty fifteen. I haven't seen I that one. Yeah, it's, it's uh, from uh, Randall Ray in 20, this is the second edition from 2015. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. yeah I guess okay. that makes sense. Well, it's generally easy. known as, yeah. that's the name of that book, but it's generally yeah. known as, I'm not, I didn't make up the name, but somebody on one of the blogs made up, one of the blog, the audience made up the name and it kind of yeah. stuck. So, but it's generally yeah, known as modern I know monetary, it's monetary, but I guess I'm, I'm confused of seeing the book here, but uh, modern monetary yeah. theory is um, there's a lot of modern developments at the moment uh, w when it comes to money. Uh, for example, the, yeah. um, the evolution of, of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, those sure. types of things, uh, where communities come together online and, and define their own currency without a state sure. being involved. Um, and also we see uh, autonomous uh, decentralized um, organizations evolve that uh, have communities and use, the, use their own currency. Is that, uh, in, in what way does that uh, contradict um, MMT or does MMT also allow for non-state currencies to flourish? Because taxes drive money. That's one of the most important uh, yeah. observations, uh, observation by MMT. But yeah. in this case, we don't have uh, a tax that, that drives the value of a currency, but we do see a currency uh, uh, having value in, in the cryptocurrency uh, yeah. community. So how would you um, yeah. uh, relate so, yeah, to we that? Provide, we provide the framework of analysis that looks at that. And you know the privacy issue is very big in those things. So it, it drives a lot of that. And uh, we have uh, an organization called Money on the Left. And uh, in particular, Rohan Gray has done a lot of good work on you know, the whole privacy issue and you know how crypto is addressing that and what it means for the, you know, monetary systems. But uh, so I won't, oh, you know, and I don't pay a lot of attention to those details, not that they're not important. It's just, I can't do everything. So um, uh, these, you know, communities have always had their own uh, uh, systems. We've had local government that taxes and spends independently of the, you know, central governments for a long time. We've had um, communities have all kinds of barter type systems, all kinds of promotions and all kinds of tax. They have their own types of taxes and everything else. And that's, that all falls under this broad framework of analysis called modern monetary theory. Now the word modern, of course, is a, a kind of tug in cheek because the joke is, you know, Kane, it comes from a quote from Keynes who said, yes, it's modern. It's only been around 10,000 years now or something like that. So you know, Randy Ray picked that up in his book, Understanding Modern Money, back in 1998. And so that's where the, that idea of modern came from. Uh, and uh, so don't look at it as, as any claim that this is new. It, it's, it's absolutely not. That's not where the name came from. So I'll, I'll stop and let you rephrase your question after all that. So. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, but it describes the, um, the mechanism of how state money works um, and, yes. and how the, the well, government... Fixed and floating. I, you know, look, my paper describes fixed exchange rate, gold standard, and all that. Also, it's called like, uh, exchange rate policy and flow employment. The, the point being that if you have a floating... Ex if you want to support full employment continuously, which optimizes your real output, if that's important, you have to have floating exchange rates. 
because if you have fixed exchange rates, there will be times when to support the fixed exchange rate, you can't have full employment. You have to have unemployment. Now that might be a choice. Some people might prefer that. Yeah, but, but it shows that the, 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 the government is, is the issuer of the currency. And now we have um, new types of, of, of currencies or digital assets that yeah. exist yeah. that um, have no government backing and, and yeah. it lives in a decentralized fashion. Uh, yeah. in virtual world uh, and but people yeah. rally behind those projects people attach value to those um, tokens yeah. and some people yeah. even argue that we should uh, um, get rid of of state currencies uh, yeah. in general um, uh, how do you see that well, uh, in the state currency the framework the state currency functions first to provision the state and if they don't have it they don't have any way to do that so uh you know, if you come up with another way to provision the state, that's okay. But they've always done it with a tax liability where the tax credit, the euro, the dollar, the yen, the tax credit is their unique creation. And that's how they make sure they have soldiers and public health workers and everything else that they we want done collectively. So our collective action is financed by, uh, you know, tax liabilities that create unemployment, looking for the tax credit so that the government can hire them. Our money story describes the framework of analysis for how a, a government or any local authority, any, anybody, you know, can provision themselves. And it's been done for thousands of years. This is not something new. And there hasn't been another way of state provisioning that we've observed. Now, if there is, I'm pretty sure it would fit somehow under this framework, but I, we haven't seen it historically. Uh, not that it can't happen. Yeah, it's there a bit like, for example, uh, um, Ecuador or Panama using the dollar uh, as a, yeah. as um, so they cannot yeah. create the currency themselves. They would need to actually raise the taxes um, and then be able to spend. Yes, yes. Um, and right, of right, course, right. a government like El Salvador is now uh, deciding yeah. to also use Bitcoin. Any government could also decide to use Bitcoin or or the dollar or any other um, foreign uh, currency, for that matter, well, to fund its well, its uh, prov to fund its operations to provision itself, right? Yeah. That, that's they, it. they, you know, they could, but they haven't done that yet. You know, they if they use Bitcoin, they're still valuing it in terms of dollars or euros or something. You know, it has they're, they're using it as a commodity and not as you know an actual unit of uh, as a tax credit. They're not saying your taxes for the year are you know 0.7. Bitcoin, no matter what the value of the Bitcoin does, you know, so they're, they're just using it as a numeraire and, and countries have used a lot of things as numeraires and that's fine. You know, the oil is priced in dollars. That's a numeraire. You can pay for it anything you want, but so it, uh, it's a reference. They're using it as a reference and that's okay. You know, and we, you know, that falls under the framework of analysis. And if they wanted to use it as the actual credit, that would work too. Now I, it's been too, um, they haven't come up with a workable way to do that. I don't think anybody has. I haven't seen it that they've come up with a workable way to use a, a Bitcoin, you know, as a tax credit. But maybe somebody could do that. In which case, it'll fall under the same framework. Right now, it's just an asset like, like gold. Gold's existed for a long time, and it, there have been attempts to use gold as the um, the unit, you know, as, the, as a tax credit and uh, to find a currency in terms of so many ounces of gold. And it's persisted for periods of time, but like you said, uh, uh, it's got limitations. You can't sustain full employment. You can't fight a war. You can't do a lot of things. Uh, you have to then suspend that. You know, otherwise, a lot of the things that uh, governments want to do, presumably the will of the people, but I don't, I don't want to argue that too much, uh, you know, doesn't work under gold as a unit or Bitcoin as a unit, it just doesn't, it's just dysfunctional. So uh, if somebody could make it functional, I'm sure that would be, that would fit right in. I, you know, so I'm not categorically against it. I just don't see it now fitting, you know, the, the, the role that the state currency plays, the, the tax credits play right now. Uh, it will be interesting to see in the future if, if there's indeed a, a country at some point who is going to fund itself completely with using, using a, 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 a decentralized asset such as Bitcoin and not relying uh, anymore on its own currency uh, to, uh, to yeah. issue. I think they're going to be relying on tax credits because without a course of taxation, there's no way to provision a government that I've ever seen. You know, it's, it's always it's always force and coercion somehow. Yeah. So, you know, I, they'd have to somehow coerce a need for these things. And uh, 
right now there's no use value for any of it. It's just yeah, you know, unless there's the market privacy. demand. If a lot of let's say a lot of big companies uh, are going to uh, um, require uh, payments in Bitcoin, for example, and there's a lot of big companies that already accept it or are going to accept it, then it, there's yeah. a market demand. So then you don't necessarily need to have the tax. Um, coercion in order to uh, yeah. have uh, value in the currency. So so far, so far, those companies that accept it, it's a numerator. So if you got to buy a Tesla, they'll look at the price of Bitcoin versus the dollar price of the car, and then they'll tell you how many Bitcoin. They don't just say a car is going to cost one Bitcoin, you know, which yeah. is about the cost of a Tesla. And even if the dollar price goes up and down, it's going to be one Bitcoin. Yeah, they have companies haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying some company won't do that, but. I want to say this privacy thing is is large, and I think it's I think a lot of the use for these cryptos has been a use that used to be um, accommodated by uh, numbered Swiss bank accounts and numbered accounts in other places, and they've all gone by the wayside. And so I think we're seeing the same time of type of um, demand <laughs> coming into the this this space, as evidenced by every time the authorities break into one, a lot of the activity looks like the same type of activity they found when they broke into numbered accounts, you know, so. Yeah, I think there's much more to it than that, but I'm sure there's, uh, there's people that people use it uh, for that for that purpose as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I mean, stable coins right now, they're going to be yeah. regulated. Uh, and I, I think uh, yeah, it makes yeah. sense yeah, 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 to treat yeah. them like banks, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's another fixed exchange rate uh, setup and it has it has its uses, you know. Yeah. And so where can uh, people uh, learn more about your work? Where, where can the best to find you? Okay. So uh, MoslerEconomics.com is my uh, website. And um, I also am on Twitter, Warren Mosler, W.B. Mosler. Uh, and uh, it's all there spelled out. And what else would you like? No, that's good enough. You're very approachable on Twitter. So thanks a lot for replying yeah. to me. That's uh, sure. much appreciated. Um, yeah. well, it was very in insightful. Book, this, uh, the seven deadly innocent frauds of economic policy is a good, it's like a pamphlet, they call it a book and it's online and it's everything I have is free. You know, you just download it. It's right there. Yeah. Good stuff. Anything else uh, from your side, uh, Warren, you want to add? No, I appreciate it. Keep, keep fighting a good fight out there. Yeah, thanks a lot for educating uh, everyone. And um, even yeah. though we probably don't always agree, it was very uh, illuminating to read your work and uh, to talk to you. So thanks a lot, Warren. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. -bye. Bye.